Right, so um, today we're looking at gram-positive bacteria, looking at gram-positive secretion, and we're going to focus in on one particular system in, in more detail, and that's the so-called ESX secretion system. So again, just to provide you with some context, this is... So you've got the E. coli handouts, have you? Did I give you those? Yeah, okay. So I'll sort those out. Um, so we've got this lecture here, and then one more lecture next week. Um, and then that will be that for me. And you've got Professor Penn and Dr. Lovering uh, finishing things up. Now, when we look at, just to remind you of some very basic bacteriology, we, when we look at the morphological point of view of uh, bacteria, we see this dichotomy. It's not so much in the gram stain, but in the number of membranes that they have. So we have these monoderms are mostly the gram positives, uh, which are bound by a single biological membrane, a cytoplasmic membrane. And then in others, we have these di the diderms, we have the, the, the gram negatives, these are bound by these two concentric but distinct membranes. So we're now going to focus in on these monoderms, or the gram positive bacteria. Now there's just a few caveats, because the two, the monoderm and gram-positive um, uh, and the phylogenetic names of the phyla don't quite map perfectly, but nearly. So gram-positive bacteria kind of are a phylogenetically coherent group, but they fall into two different phyla, uh, which are often uh, described on the basis of the GC content of the genome. So <coughs> organisms like Bacillus subtilis or Staph aureus, they have a low G plus C percentage in their genome, whereas organisms like Mycobacterium tuberculosis or Crinobacterium diphtheriae have a high GC content. And they're given these violent names, Firmicutes and Actinobacteria. The complication is that there is a, a group of Firmicutes called the negative acutes, which actually are gram-negative. They have a double membrane. They have a, a cell wall that looks like a gram-negative cell wall. And it's a matter of extreme interest, a very curious thing, that how on earth this can happen, how you can have a, a, a group that's nested phylogenetically within the gram-positives that happens to be gram-negative. But that's not the subject of today's lecture. It's something I'd actually like to do some more research on when I get some time. They're also, um, among the actinobacteria, things like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, we typically don't think of it as a gram-positive bacterium, even though it falls within <coughs> uh, a phylum that contains gram-positives. And we, we usually describe them as acid fast bacilli, and that's because their cell walls have become so complex that they're not particularly good at being stained with a gram stain, and we use this acid fast staining approach instead. So again, just to remind you about uh, provide the context in this monoderm here we have secretion and export amounting to the same thing. Basically we're getting proteins across that one membrane. Uh, they're going through the cell wall as well. Um, uh, peptidoglycan there. Much thicker peptidoglycan layer in gram positives than there is in gram negatives. Uh, but there is no outer membrane. Well, apart from the in and tuberculosis, some people could talk about such a thing. We'll, we'll say more about that in a moment. So, as I say, very thick layer of peptidoglycan. And then in, embedded in this are these tychoic acids. You, you've heard more about all this think, already. We, we've had the lectures on that already from Andy Lovering, haven't we? So I don't need to go over this. The lipoconectoic acids and then catch and so forth. So this is what we have to get our proteins across. In actinomycetes, a much more complex picture with this um, mycolic acid layer. Um, these are arabinogalactans. This outer layer, which is sometimes called outer membrane, sometimes called a capsule, that contains glucans and arabinomannans. So when we're looking at gram-positive secretion, what do we find in terms of the repertoire of secretion systems? Well, here's the full list, and uh, we're not going to go over all of these, but there are six established gram-positive secretion systems. Uh, the top of the list there is the SEC system, the 
which we mentioned already in gram negatives, TAP pathway, flagella export apparatus, a couple there, the fibrillin and protein export in Holins that I'm not going to mention. But most of today, we're going to talk about this uh, WXG100 secretion system or WSS or ESX secretion system. A couple of other putative secretion systems where it's not quite clear what's going on. And then the subsequent lecture uh, later in the course next week will be on targeting of secreted proteins once they've been secreted. And there's a particular mechanism, an enzyme called sortase, that does that very efficiently, which we'll talk about later. So here's uh, another busy diagram from uh, UK and Desvo's review. Uh, this time summarising uh, secreted proteins and secretion systems in gram-positive bacteria. So you've got the SEC system here, TAT here, the general apparatus here, and then we're going to spend most of our time talking about this one, WSS. Uh, and next time round, we're going to talk about uh, the way in which some of those secreted proteins actually get tethered covalently to the peptidoglycan through a, uh, an enzyme called um, sortase. Now the SEC pathway, as I say, is the, that's the predominant pathway. It accounts for most protein export across the cytoplasmic membrane. It's essential in all bacteria, gram, gram net positives as well as gram negatives. And we've already described this membrane spanning translocase channel with these proteins SEC Y and G. And then there are these accessory proteins complex with C and SEC uh, DF or, or Wedge C. The main difference uh, between the, the, what we see in gram positives and what we see in gram negatives though is that the, there is no SEC B in the gram positives. So there's this chaperone in the, the gram negative bacteria which we do not see in the gram positive systems. And again just to remind you how this works, SEC A drives secretion with protein motive force, binds substrates, Delivers them to the, um, uh, delivers them by binding to these membrane phospholipids and, and, and uh, acts as a translocase. And as, as an ATPase energizes that translocation, and you get this stepwise export. And then in gram positives, just as in gram negatives, the SEC dependent proteins that get exported have a, a signal sequence at the end terminus with characteristic. Features that you can recognise just by, e even by eyeballing the sequence, you can recognise that there's a signal peptide, there's a positively charged N domain, this hydrophobic H domain, the N domain about three, four, five residues long, then there's maybe a dozen residues that make this H domain, and then a few residues, a handful that make up this polar C domain, and then there's a cleavage site, and there are signal peptidases which cleave off the, these. Um, signal peptides once the protein has been exported. So that just uh, summarises what I've said diagrammatically. Um, now, another interesting feature that's been discovered in recent years in gram positives is that there is actually a, an accessory SEC secretion pathway known as SEC-A2, um, and in some streptococci, Streptococcus gordonii and parasanguinis, there's, there's SEC-A2 and the SEC-Y2 together, this kind of totally separate new system there, if you like, accessory system. And that seems to be dedicated to these very, very large glycoproteins that have very long signal sequences. So there does seem to be a division of labour not just totally redundant, this is a separate system that does something slightly different from SEC-A. In mycobacteria and in listeria, um, there is this SOD-A uh, protein, um, in, in, which encodes a superoxide dismutase, um, and this is uh, dependent on SEC-A too, but here there doesn't appear to be a signal peptide that gets cleaved off. Um, and there are, it's, it's an area of ongoing research as to what other proteins are going through this system and which of them are actually important in virulence. And we really don't yet have a good understanding of what's going on. What, what, why is there a second system here, this SEC-A2 system, and 
how is it working with SECA, the, the original system, and, and, and so forth. <coughs> TAP pathway, we mentioned this in gram negatives. You had this in gram positives as well. It's N terminal signal peptide, the twin arginine motif in there. It's N domain, H domain. Substrates go through in a folded state. Um, and in gram positives, it's clear that there are TAP dependent proteins, M tuberculosis. Uh, there are several of those have been uh, been described. What phospholipase C is one of them, it's, uh, which may be involved in virulence. Um, and in Staph aureus, it's known that an iron import system called FEP ABC is TAP dependent as well. Um, and there, there's, that's translocating this, the, particularly the perioxidase um, FEP B in that system through TAP. Flagella export, we mentioned uh, in gram negatives in detail, and we briefly mentioned gram positives there as well. It's eff effectively the same kind of system in a gram positive, but there are no P or L rings because there's no outer membrane. So we have this uh, rod here that's spanning the peptide glycan, these protein rings here, uh, and then the hook at the side. There are uh, some differences in gene regulation. In, in, uh, Vasilis subtilis is really the only organism where people have studied the uh, flagella system in any detail, uh, the, the only gram-positive organism. And there are some uh, differences here from what we see with, say, the canonical salmonella system. Um, so there's a different sigma factor involved in uh, regulating the flagellin gene this kind of stochastic on-off switching of flagella gene expression. And there are other uh, players in the game of regulation, these so-called transition state regulators, SCO, C, and so forth. So the flagella system and the regulation of the flagella system is embedded in the global regulation of genes in Bacillus subtilis, and we haven't said anything about that anywhere else in the course. I'm not going to start really going into that now. Now, what I'm going to do now for the rest of the, of the talk is talk about this uh, particular system, the WXG100 secretion system, uh, which starts off, our story begins with a protein called ESAT6. So this is a small protein, less than 100 amino acids, comes from mycobacterium tuberculosis. ESAT6 stands for Early Secreted Antigenic Target 6. Now that was back in, uh, because back in the old days when people were first studying M tuberculosis and doing molecular biology on it, they were trying to determine what proteins there were, and this is one that was found to be secreted early in culture. When you set up a, a culture in the lab, very quickly this is appearing in the supernatant, and it, it was running on a gel as if it was six kilodaltons, although obviously from calculate its actual molecular weight is actually slightly higher than that. Now the interesting thing was that it was appearing in the supernatant, but when you looked at the sequence, it had no N-terminal signal peptide. So it looked as if it was not going through a SEC-dependent system. It's missing in BCG, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Particularly useful in immunodiagnosis. And there is a whole million dollar industry now focused on this molecule because it's missing in BCG, you can actually detect the immune response to it, which gives you um, a very clear answer as to whether a person's been infected or exposed to, infected with or exposed to a mycobacter, virulent mycobacterium tuberculosis. So in this country, we all get given BCG, uh, and that means that we will produce an immune response to mycobacterial antigens generally. Because this one's missing in BCG, it's a very useful target there. It interacts with a, a homologous protein called CFP10, culture filter, filter, filtrate protein 10. Um, they actually form this array of coil coils here, so there's two helices in each one interacting like this, and then there are terminal and C terminal with bits stuck on. And we'll say more about the fact that they form a multi-protein family in tuberculosis in a while. They, they actually come in pairs. 
let's just step back um, and, if you like, appreciate the importance of ESAT 6 and CFP 10 in, in kind of global terms. So you may have heard of BCG. BCG stands for Bacille Calmet Gain. Uh, this is a tuberculosis vaccine strain. It was derived originally from a, a bovine tubercle bacillus. So Mycobacterium tuberculosis comes in two varieties, the one that affects humans predominantly and one that affects uh, cows predominantly, although humans can get the cow one, and I think probably vice versa as well. Uh, and what they did was that they just subcultured the organism on this glycerinated potato medium containing beef bile, and they just kept subculturing it and subculturing it. They did this 230 times uh, over a period of over 10 years. So they were devoted individuals. Um, and what they found was that even after 15 passages, just 15 passages, the colonial morphology that they saw changed, and the strain started to show decreased virulence for laboratory animals. So by 1921, they were convinced that it was now solidly safe in animals and could provide protection against challenge of virulent M tuberculosis. And so it, it, it was then <coughs> given to humans. And it's now been, been given to over 3 billion people. Uh, and all of that going on before anyone really understood what had happened. How had it actually become attenuated? Because at the very first studies of the genome, it looked very, very similar to uh, virulent tuberculosis. So in fact, what uh, happened was that they, back in the uh, late 90s and, and early 2000s, uh, people started sequencing genomes. This guy, Roland Brosch, was one of the uh, pioneers in this <coughs> field. And what he found was that if you compared the BCG genome with that of virulent tuberculosis, you found scattered around the the chromosome, these so-called RDs, or regions of difference. And one of them, RD1, which you can see up there, actually is the locus that encodes ESAT6. So it's not clear when you first look at the genome of BCG which of these loci are important in the attenuation of BCG. But additional studies uh, since then looking at the genomic evolution of M. tuberculosis, have revealed that um, RD1 is crucial, the absolutely crucial universal deletion that you see in all BCG lineages. And so it does appear to be uh, actually uh, pivotal in that attenuation. In fact, uh, here's a uh, zooming in... There's now been studies done on all lots of different BCG lineages because BCG was propagated around the world. Different um, vaccine institutes would maintain their own stocks. They started to diverge somewhat. But right at the beginning there, in 1908 to 1921, it's clear that RD1 was the first thing to be lost. <coughs> you can see the CRP mutation here. Actually, that was something we discovered here in Birmingham. Uh, a few years ago as an, another early mutation, but uh, nowhere near as important as uh, the, the loss of RD1. So this RD1 encodes ESAT6. ESAT6 is encoded by a gene ESXA, uh, which is next to ES, ESXB, which encodes CFP10. And these are pair of proteins are prototypes of a whole family of proteins in M. tuberculosis. So when the genome was sequenced, it was clear that these were not alone. There were actually 23 homologs of these proteins, these small secreted proteins in the genome, all lacking N-terminal signal sequences. And most of them occurred in tandem pairs, uh, uh, 11 different genomic loci. So the idea was floating in the wind very early on that maybe there was a secretion system dedicated to these proteins, um, perhaps an ATP-powered one, uh, because there were ATPases encoded in the genome nearby. So this is um, there are 
five loci which have lots and lots of other genes with them. Uh, there are six loci where you just have the pair of, of, of the ESAT6 homologue and the CFP10 homologue. But these extensive loci, they've been given the names ESX1 to 5, and you can see within them that you have the ESAT6 up there and CFP10 <coughs> in turquoise and blue. And there are homologues here cent cent in the centre of, of, of each locus. And um, in association with these, there are always these various ATPases. There's this ATPase that's got a, a what's known as an FTSK SPO3 E domain in it. And then there's another ATPase that's got, it's called the AAA plus uh, ATPase. Um, and so the fact that there was this conserved uh, set of genes as in association with these started people thinking that maybe there was a, a dedicated secretion system also encoded by the locus. Um, and this shows a kind of reconstruction of what that secretion system might look like based on the fact that you can recognise ATPA's domains pretty easily in, in sequences and you can also <coughs> recognise transmembrane domains. Um, and so what they've shown here are the predicted transmembrane domains associated with the various proteins encoded in this locus. So it does look as if there's quite a few proteins stuck in the inner membrane. Uh, some of them have got domains that are actually extracellular, some that might be intracellular. Still a huge mystery as to how anything gets across the outer membrane and the rest of the cell wall. That's a, a big, big, big mystery indeed. But uh, it, you know, the, back, back about 10 years ago, the idea was in the wind. And I actually wrote a paper in 2002 what I did was I thought, well, is this system really particular to M tuberculosis? Okay, so, hello? Sorry, is, it, is that the system, is it functional or is it actually known? Like all the structures and shit? I'm telling you it's a historical narrative. So back then it was putative, oh. now it's known. So I'm, I'm just trying to take it slightly as a historical story rather than tell you everything all at once. So back in 2002, I, I actually noticed that... Um, uh, you know, I've been reading the literature, seen all this stuff, and I thought, I wonder if, if we actually use sensitive methods of detecting new homologues, can we find anything else out? Uh, and at that time, there was a crop of new genomes becoming available. And what I found was that if you do use this program, Cyblast, we, you could see homologues of, uh, of ESAT6 and, uh, and, and CFP10 in a whole range of bacteria, gram-positive bacteria that are, have come from the low GC group, the Firmicutes, uh, not just from the close relatives of, of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And what, what was also clear uh, was that there was um, a, in Bacillus subtilis, there's a protein called UKA, so the ESAT6 homologue is called UKE, and there's a protein called UKA, which is a, has this FDSK SPO3 uh, ATPase domain in it. So that just shows you um, an alignment of all these proteins uh, from lots of different sources. You can see uh, some, uh, some from my other mycobacteria, some from bacteria, but also some from Clostridia, from um, Bacillus and so forth. And one of the things that you probably can see from the back of the room is the most conserved part. It's right here in the center, there's this W and then there's a G, and between them it's a bit variable. So I, I just christened them the WXG100 proteins for this particular motif and the fact they're about 100 amino acids long. And as I say, they, uh, the thing that clinched it for me, when you look at these kind of similarities, these homologies, putative sequence homologies, you can sometimes be fooling yourself. You know, you're looking at this and think, is that a real relationship or is it just chance and whatever. But the thing that clinched it was when you look in the uh, genomes of a variety of different organisms, so this is, this is TB up here, and you've got your um, SPO3 uh, domain up here, and then you've got your two 
secreted proteins in, in, encoded there. In Staph aureus, you have the same kind of context. You've got that ATPase there, and then you've got these two, as I say, in um, the psilocyphalis, this UK. In fact, it's UK and it's adjacent uh, uh, gene, UK B, uh, homologous here. And this is in Clostridium acetobutylicum. Again, you'll see, so the gene order is not absolutely conserved, but wherever you see these homologues of um, the ESAT6 CFP10 pair, you also see that ATPase nearby. Also worth noticing, noting that you don't see much else in these low GC uh, gram uh, positive bacteria. So it, what are all the other things that you find in mycobacterium tuberculosis, if this is a, a conserved secretion system, they are not absolutely essential. They're obviously accessory elements that are fine-tuning what goes on in TB, but they're not essential for the whole system. <coughs> so what are these FTSK SPO3 domains? Well, they're an ATPase domain that are found in DNA pumps. So FTSK in E. coli is a cell division protein. So when the cell is dividing, you need to get the, 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 the daughter chromosomes pushed into the the right sides of the cell, so that one goes with one part of the cell and the other goes with the other part of the cell, and that's what FTSK does. Similarly with uh, Bacillus subtilis, you need to get uh, your bits of genome into the, into the right place, into the spore, and spo 3 e is involved in that. And there are some Streptomyces plasmid transfer proteins that also have these kind of domains in them. So it, it, it's thought to be a hexameric uh, ATPA, so rather similar to the, the ones we saw in type 3 secretion uh, in an earlier talk. So we, we now accept that there is indeed a, a secretion system in M tuberculosis, but um, doesn't uh, appear to be quite the same as, as type 3 and type 4 secretion systems that we see in gram negatives, where there is that polarized secretion. So, the type 3 secretion system, you have this molecular syringe, and you don't see the actual secretion targets just being thrown out into the supernatant. Whereas here, that's part of the definition of early secreted antigen target 6. It just gets out into the supernatant. So there's no requirement for cell contact with eukaryotic cells or whatever. But we still don't quite know what's... We have no real understanding yet, even after 10 years, of what is going on here. And there... There is still a doubt in my mind whether ESAT6 is actually a substrate of the apparatus or whether it's a part of the secretion apparatus or whether it's doing a bit of both. What has been revealed in the, in the recent years is that the, there is uh, some uh, regulatory mechanisms involved in, in regulating the secretion of ESAT6 and CFP10. There's a, a protein called FOP. Uh, these are RB numbers are given after because the, the first bacterial, mycobacterial genome to be sequenced was from a, a strain called H37RV. And so people tend to use those RB numbers to talk about TB genes uh, and proteins. So there's this FOP and then there's a regulator uh, called SR. And they both appear to, to regulate uh, ESAT6 uh, secretion and and things going on the R well E6 is E6 expression and things going on in the R D one region, but also this uh, operon here has been described, R V uh, 16 to fourteen. Um, and this appears to be um, required for ESAT six secretion and CFP ten secretion, but it's not inside the R D one region. So it's a bit like we were saying the other day about with the Lee, you kind of imagine that it's a compact thing that does everything self-contained. You might think the same about RD1, but in fact it does appear to be these other uh, loci outside that are controlling things. And uh, this is a, a cartoon of uh, what they're suggesting in, uh, as, a, a, as a model of how it all works, that you have this um, ESPR uh, binding and you get high activity of these proteins and they're going out and, uh, when there's less of the SPR around intermediate and then when there's no SPR the system is basically shut down um, and presumably there are signals which are not yet known which are regulating the transition between these different states 
So, what's it all about? What does ESX1 do? Well, we know that ESX1 mutations, if you take out the locus, you take out just the ESAT6, you get attenuation. You get attenuation in macrophages, you get attenuation in, in mice. And that's been replicated in M. bovis and in, M, in another microbacterium, M. marinum, as well. In fact, if you take out ESAT6 and CFP10, you almost get uh, as full a reduction in virulence as you see in BCG. So although BCG probably was propagated many years after RD1 was lost, and it did accumulate many more mutations, it appears that just knocking out this pathway is enough to attenuate uh, M tuberculosis down to the level of BCG. Very nearly, not perfect, not quite, but, but very nearly. Now, there are many things that have been described in literature. It is a very confusing situation. And it's unclear what things that have been described are actually accounting for this role in virulence. We don't have a joined-up picture. So, if you look at some papers, they'll say that, it, that this locus is contributing to the blocking of phagosome maturation and tuberculosis, intracellular pathogen, and ESX1 is contributing to that. It's limiting the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Roland Brosch at the Institut Pasteur has this hypothesis that ESAT6 is actually a kind of uh, lysing. It's actually lysing host cell membranes. And that's its, its kind of biochemical role, which underlies its biological role. It's known that this system also promotes host cell necrosis necrosis, spread to other cells, phagosomal escape, so it also recruits uninfected macrophages to granulomas, where so the granuloma is the sort of basic lesion, microscopic <coughs> lesion that you see in tuberculosis, you've had lectures on this haven't you, so, um, and it appears that uh, ESAT6 is required for that as well. Now, what does it actually do? If we look at the different papers out there, it's hard to see kind of grand unified theory of what ESAT6 is all about. Uh, so this is that paper I mentioned from Roland Brosch from a few years ago, showing that uh, you can get ESAT6 to dissociate under certain conditions from CFP10 and then uh, exhibit membrane lysing activity. This is a paper from Science, I think from last year or the year before, which suggests that ESAT6 secretion is all about recruiting macrophages <coughs> via effects on matrix metalloproteases, MMP9 in particular, and that that's what it's doing. To me, this is a bit like uh, the, the old story of the people with the elephant. I'll show you a slide of that in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. One other spanner in the works. You remember I said that in all the other contexts where we see these um, FTS... Uh, FTSK, uh, SPO3 domains, we see them in DNA pumps. And then this paper turned up where they showed that the RD1 locus in uh, uh, an organism called Mycobacterium smegmatis, which is a harmless, non-pathogenic mycobacterium, which is commonly used because it grows fairly quickly. It's commonly used as a model. Here they showed that it actually regulates DNA transfer in there. So it's kind of moonlighting, it's a virulence factor, but it's also involved in, in plasmid transfer. Um, uh, some kind of conjugative uh, process going on. Um, a different system, the ESX3 system, has also been studied, particularly by Eric Rubin's group, and they have shown that this is actually required for iron acquisition iron acquisition by these things called mycobactins, um, which are um, proteins which go out and, and uh, scavenge, uh, uh, no, they're not proteins, they're siderophores that go out and scavenge iron. And uh, what they've shown is that you can, that you, you can knock out the, the, the genes and see that there's a defect if you're trying to grow things in low iron concentrations, um, but you can trans-complement that 
if you take supernatant or cold culture with a wild type strain, suggesting that there are secreted factors that are going out into the supernatant and helping get the iron in or doing something there. But we don't know what those things are yet. So we have this kind of idea that it's something to do with iron, but it's not clear what exactly is going on. Um, ESX5, or another one of these loci, not really been studied in tuberculosis, but in M. marinum, it's been shown to be uh, required for the export of many of these so-called PEPPE proteins. I don't know, have you heard about these? Have you been taught about these before? No. So these, are, these were another surprise when the M. tuberculosis genome was sequenced. It's found that there was this very large family of proteins, uh, these two different kinds of proteins, um, which either contain uh, repeats rich in proline um, and uh, no, glutamic acid or proline proline and glutamic acid and the, and the PE and PPE are just a single letter amino acid code for those uh, motifs um, and those are very abundant but we don't really understand what they do they're found only in mycobacteria um, and um, in and marinum, one of these in particular, PPE41, has been shown to go through this ESX5 system, require it at least, and it lacks any kind of signal peptide. So, here I was getting ahead of myself. We're pretty much like the blind men with the elephant with this. We don't really know what's going on. I don't think anyone really knows what ESAT6, CFP10, ESX secretion, uh, it is all about in, in this setting. Um, it, it, it's a bit of a mystery, you know, it, it seems to be different people come along with different ideas, but we haven't yet really nailed this. What I would put forward is that we have to step back a bit from tuberculosis. Um, and in a review I wrote a few years ago for Nature, we put forward the idea that actually many of the interactions that you see between bacteria and humans uh, that's kind of incidental to the big picture. Bacteria are actually interacting with all sorts of other organisms, <coughs> from bacteriophage to predatory bacteria to amoebae, flies, fungi, worms, annelids, and nematodes, uh, and even and plants. And that perhaps we need to look at those interactions to understand the evolution of, ha of, of um, various virulence factors and particularly to understand the context in which conserved uh, systems operate. So how, if we took the anthropocentric view, which was what all the people in the TB community go on about, ah, oh, ESAT6, these systems all about virulence, how do we explain the fact that they're in organisms like Bacillus subtilis, which doesn't cause disease, not a, not a pathogen as far as we're concerned, or Clostridium acetobutylicum? Uh, so either they have some more general role, which is not necessarily virulence specific, or if you like, we have to generalise our view of virulence to say, well, maybe Bacillus subtilis in the soil is struggling with nematodes and it's using these systems for that purpose. Um, and we, we still, as I say, it's, I'm, I'm not yet convinced that we know that the WXG100 proteins, ESAT6 and its homologs, are actually the, 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 the final target of these systems. They may be a component of the whole secretion system rather than something that's been secreted with a purpose in mind, if you like. Now, what one of the most rewarding things in, uh, in the last few years for me was that um, all this sequence gazing I did 10 years ago, predicting that they, there were these systems, there were these secretion systems in other organisms, this actually bore fruit, particularly due to the efforts of a lady called Dominique Misiakis, who, who uh, works at the University of Chicago. Um, and she works, she and her husband, Olaf Schneewin work on uh, Staph aureus, uh, and they, she actually then uh, took what I said seriously, and she went in and made 
uh, mutants, and she, she investigated uh, secretion profiles and so forth, and she showed that basically the ESX A and B are clustered in six other genes. Some of these are required for synthesis or secretion. Mutants that fail to secrete these show defects in pathogenesis. So that is a very interesting finding that this system, although we, I, I, a minute ago I said, oh, it's nothing to do with pathogenesis, it's kind of interesting that in a complete, well, very distantly related organism from them tuberculosis, we still see this system actually contributing to virulence um, and, and they display these defects in, in pathogenesis in, in the murine abscess model of uh, Staph aureus infection. She also came in, uh, produced a paper a, a few years later where she showed that there was a, an additional substrate for this system, called e, what she called the ESAC, and she also solved the structure of uh, the two components, the ESXA and B, in um, uh, Staph aureus. Um, and so she came up with this uh, model for how things are regulated in that system. And then to cap it all, she's uh, now also looked at a similar system in Bacillus anthracis, the causative agent of anthrax, and shown that this system also uh, is a secretion system. The, the WXG100 proteins are, uh, some of them are at least are secreted. Um, Interestingly, this was this is, Bacillus anthracis is always one of the unusual uh, organisms in, in the survey I did because in every other context we see these WXG100 proteins as standalone proteins of about 100 amino acids. But in Bacillus anthracis, you saw that stretch of homology embedded in a much larger protein that may be several hundred amino acids long usually at the N-terminus, um, and there were, I think, what, half a dozen of these in there, as you said, six of them. Uh, and so this was a, an interesting variation on the general theme, and she showed that some of these extended proteins were indeed secreted. We've done a little bit more work on this here uh, in, in Birmingham. So uh, a few years ago... Uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Mark Anthony, targeted uh, Streptococcus agalactii, uh, otherwise known as group B strep, which causes infection in um, neonates and in pregnant women. Um, and it, it had been shown, I, I trained it from uh, sequence uh, surveys, that, it, that this system, uh, there was likely to be a system here, and they managed to purify the ESAT-6 homologue and get a crystal structure for it. Um, they, they were never able to actually get clear evidence of secretion of this protein in, in, the, in this organism. They, they had a rather, rock, a rather a kind of rocky road there trying to get that to be done. But they did get these, these structures. And one interesting thing that was found in the structures, so you've got this same kind of um, uh, four helix bundle that we see in other ESAT-6 homolog pairs. But in the structures as well, Scott White, one of our crystallographers, noticed that there were these elongated fiber-like assemblies in the crystal structure. And he said, you know, maybe this is something physiological. Maybe these things are forming fibers in some physiological context. That chimes quite nicely with my idea that maybe this is the equivalent of, in, in type 3 secretion, you say ESPA, in the Lee encoded system is chucked out into supernatant in huge amounts and it forms that pillars. Maybe something else is going on here. Or maybe we're just seeing patterns in the clouds. There's no meaning to this at all. We don't know. It's still, this is research. It's still ongoing. I've almost finished now. So when Scott reported that structure, he actually searched the structure databases to look for related structures. And he said, oh, he'd found ESAT 6 and so forth. But he also found a protein from H. pylori. Helicobacter pylori, gram-negative bacterium, lives in the stomach. He said, well, that can't be right. This is a gram-positive secretion system. We, I, 
described, it was present in a lot of gram positives, but never, you know, it's not going to be gram negative. So we have that different issue that we've got a single cell uh, membrane in the gram positives, we've got double cell, uh, two membranes in the, in, in the, the gram negative. It doesn't really make much sense that you just take a gram positive system and chuck it into a gram negative. Would, what would it do? Would it secrete into the periplasm? Who knows? And I said, anyway, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but anyway, I had a look at this paper which described that structure that he'd found, it's homologous at the structural level, very similar. And if you look at it there, it didn't say anything about ESAT 6 or anything else, but actually, if you dig into the paper, they do make a very passing reference to ESAT 6. And this is what one of my colleagues, Jeff Cole, calls ignorance led research. The people solved this structure just because they they were going through H. pylori and just finding what proteins they could purify and which ones they could solve the structure of. People do that. So it's called structural genomics. You just go and see what you can find. So they had no particular hypothesis or end in mind when they did this. They just put it out into the databases. Um, but if you look at it, you look at the structure, it does look homologous to ESAT6 CFP10. So once I saw this, I started to think, well, maybe there is something to this after all. Maybe Scott wasn't smoking something when he made this observation that he was actually rooted in reality. Um, <coughs> and then if you look actually in the genome, what you find is something quite remarkable. And so going back after nearly 10 years after I'd done my initial survey, suddenly it became clear that there were a whole clutch of these gene clusters outside of gram-positives in gram-negative organisms have the double membrane. Um, and we look at the H. pylori cluster here. We've got, at one end, we've got this uh, HSP62 uh, with the ESAT6 homology in it. But at the other end here, we've got this HSP66, which has got that ATPase, the UK type ATPase with the FTSK SPO3 E domain in it. Um, so I'm now convinced that there are indeed these systems outside of gram positives in a handful. It's only a handful of, of gram negative bacteria, and we have no idea what they're doing. And we have been struggling for the last year, more than a year probably, but uh, doing this on the back burner to see if we can actually get any evidence that there is a secretion system working here. And we've got mutants made and so forth. Anyway, that's, uh, we've come a long way from where we started, which was with uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, just conclusions here on, ESA, on these ESX systems. We've got these genome scale investigations. That's what started it off when people realized that there was uh, this RD1 missing in BCG. That's been exploited. I haven't really gone into more detail on that in this so-called Elispot test, uh, which is the, you know, the the best thing since sliced bread as far as TB diagnosis is concerned. Um, they've been found in many, many uh, gram positives <coughs> with some structural and functional characterization. We've got them. Um, these, we, we don't really know what they're doing still. And we are now finding them outside of gram positives. So the mystery continues, and I'm sure. In the next few years, we're going to get some interesting observations and perhaps a bit more true insight and understanding from these systems.